Good morning. It's the last time for a while. For a while. But we finally made it through our four weeks in six weeks. Good timing. Um, so we do find ourselves settling in for the final, final verses of this chapter. This was the paragraph that I forgot to take out of last week, so I just copied, put it in this week's. And um, so we're going to be finishing up his letter, Paul's letter to the church in Philippi. Um, I hope that something has resonated for you. For me, there's been a ton. It, it's, been, um, it's been an amazing journey for me. Um, I, uh, I've struggled through parts of this. Um, this week, again, I thought, man, it's the last few verses. I'm going to just get through this, get it written up, get it done. And again, I'm, I was sitting there last night still battling, still struggling with, with what God wanted me to get out of this. And, and the more I, I do this, the more I realize I'm not up here telling you what God wants you to hear because I don't know what God wants you to hear. I'm telling you what God wanted me to hear in hopes that you gain something from it. Um, it, has, it has definitely been eye-opening. Um, I find it an honor and a privilege to stand up here um, through the grace of God and the grace of all of you, the board, trusting me to stand here and, and, and open my mouth and hope the right things come out. But we started this journey through Paul's letter by stating that the letter to the Philippians was a letter filled with joy. Um, I had read through Philippians before, and, and joy was not what I took from it. In times past, I took that it was things I had to do. Stuff that God said, you're going to do this. And I went, eh, I don't know. Not so sure. Um, but in, in, in coming to this from a, a viewpoint of where's the joy? I had heard a couple of pastors talk about all this joy that was in Philippians, and I said, what? And I went back, and I did. I, I found that each of the chapters has a different lesson, a different facet of joy. And, and Paul wanted the church to understand these things, so he provided us an opportunity to find an increase in our own joy. The increase in our joy is only possible when we look for it in the Lord. He used that expression over and over and over throughout the book. Sometimes he camouflaged it, and he said, in Christ Jesus. But it's the same thing. The increase in our joy is only possible when we look for it in the Lord, when we are willing to surrender to him, trust in him, and to allow him to lead us down paths that we may not be comfortable with, into places we may not be familiar with. It's when we get to these places where we feel wholly unequipped to handle the situation that we will ultimately grow when we look in the Lord. It's never our strength and our power that's going to get us through these things. It's God who's going to get us through these things. If anything's shown me this, I said the past few weeks have provided us many opportunities to really begin to put what Paul is teaching into practice. And I think it's the months that we've been going through these things. It's this constant compounding of the different things that we're facing, this pandemic and everything associated with it. The disinformation, the misinformation, the lack of information, the hearing information and going, what? It's understanding that school started, but yet we're not in school. Our kids are at home sitting in front of a computer screen trying to, to glean something from 30 minutes in front of a teacher once a week or twice a week and then being stuck on their own. 
hoping that they get what they're supposed to get out of it. It's the last few days where we're dealing with the fallout from the many fires without the physical dangers that so many people are facing. Daily, minute by minute, they're facing these challenges. We're only hit with it indirectly through the smoke and the fallout from those fires. All of these issues stacked one on top of the other obviously affect our normal daily lives. That which we call normal. What we call normal is just a place of comfort. What we're used to. It's the not stepping out. It's the not following those paths that God might lead us down. Normal is our comfort zone. It's what we want. We don't want it hard. We don't want it challenging. But it's when we look for those challenges that true joy is going to come. This week... In, in writing this, there was some struggle. But I kept saying, what is it you want? And, and we've talked about finding opportunities. Asking God, pleading with God, give me the opportunity to step out. And God, true to his word, will do just that. This week, he put me in a place that I hadn't been in. It, it wasn't comfortable. I was at work, and there were discussions, as every workplace has discussions. We talk politics, society, people, nationalities, cops, firemen. And it was interesting because I, it's a very diverse group. It's not a huge group. There's only like 10 or 12 of us at work. But we age, the age range is like 59 to 20. And there is a mix of nationalities, a mix of personalities, of backgrounds. And it's interesting that I stood there for a lot of the conversation and for a change, I just listened. What was everybody talking about? What were they saying? And like our conversation a week ago, it, it bounces, it just rolls, ebbs and flows. But it was interesting that even with all these diverse backgrounds and age groups and the variety of differing opinions, that nobody got violent, nobody got upset that somebody else had a different viewpoint. What I heard most of the time was, yeah, I get your side, I, I just don't agree with you. Sorry, not gonna, not gonna agree with you. I, th I think you're wrong, but this is my point and I, I understand you disagree with me. But they didn't go to blows. They didn't go to name calling. But towards the end of the conversation, I was a little more involved in a couple of the topics because I have my strong opinions. My wife tells me all the time, I've got strong opinions and I am not afraid to voice them. But as I stood there, there's a young man there. I think, I think he's 19, 20 years old. He's probably the youngest in, in, of the staff. Um, one of the nicest kids, though. I mean, he's just such a giver. He's, he's caring. But he started to ask questions. And anyone who looks at me and goes, so you're studying to be a pastor, I have questions. Hmm. I don't know that I'm really what you want to talk to. I, and, that, and that came over me. I had that moment of, of panic, knowing that he had genuine heartfelt questions. That I needed to stand there and face it head on and, and try to answer to the best of my ability or run away and say, you know what, I, I have to get back to work. I, I have things I have to get done. But, but I, I, in the end, you know, his questions came across as, I believe in God, but do I really need to go to church? I mean, isn't my belief enough? Do I really have to go to that building? And really, what does the church have to do with my belief in God? And, and I stood there panicking. It was like, oh, man. Can't ask me something easy. Got to ask me these tough questions. And, and I'm telling you, there's days I feel totally inadequate to answer those questions because there are days where I had those questions. There's days I still have questions. 
But I did in my head take a minute and say, God, I, 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 I got nothing here. Um, I'm a total blank right now. Help me with this. And, and I paused and, and words came and I, and I gave him answers. And right, wrong, or otherwise, I, I took the chance to try. I'm not going to go into what I said because right now I can't remember it. I just can't. I, I don't remember all the things I said to him. But I know that the look on his face, he was thinking. And in the end, that's all I could ask for was that he was still open and thinking. He hadn't shut down and closed off. And it's understanding these opportunities and, and things that Paul wanted us to, to learn from him that I want to go into. So, again, Philippians is a story of joy, and I hope today to wrap that up and really um, bring it to a head. Um, but this morning, let's start where we left off at Philippians 4. And I'm sorry, this print appears to be really tiny. As I'm looking up here, I'm realizing maybe I could have cut it in half, put it on two slides. I'm really sorry. But hopefully you have a Bible with you. Or a tablet or a phone where you can read it if you can't read what's up above me. So let us read Philippians 4, 14 to 23. Yet it was good of you to share in my troubles. Moreover, as you Philippians know, in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, when I set out from Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, except you only. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid more than once when I was in need. Not that I desire your gifts. What I desire is that more be credited to your account. I have received full payment and have more than enough. I am amply supplied now that I have received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent. They are a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice pleasing to God. And my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Greet all God's people in Christ Jesus. The brothers and sisters who are with me send greetings. All God's people here send you greetings, especially those who belong to Caesar's household. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, you've, you've provided these these letters that, that Paul has sent to the churches, and, and, and they're still here for us. They still have examples and meaning in our lives today. The struggles that Paul addresses are still struggles that we face on a daily basis here. I would just ask that, that what it is you want each person to hear, you would let them hear that you would provide guidance and wisdom for them as they continue their walk forward. And Lord, I just ask that you would be here today, touching each and every life that's physically in the building and at home, watching through, through whatever electronic means they're using. And Lord, I just ask that you would be with me and provide me with the, the words to say what you would have us here. I ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. So in the opening verses... Paul stated, yet it was good of you to share in my troubles. Moreover, as you Philippians know, in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, when I set out from Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving except you only. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid more than once when I was in need. Um, I found that it was really interesting that Paul is pouring his heart out through this whole letter to the church in the Philippians. So many of the other letters, he's, he's talking to them as, as a parent to a child, as a teacher to a student, brother to brother, brother to sister, telling them of problems, things that they need to fix. But in his letter to the Philippians, he, he just really goes off telling them what a joy it is to know them, to be associated with them to have them be involved in his life. He's stressing what it is to be in a relationship. 
he, he's excited because they've shared in his mission from the beginning. He's letting them know that he's grateful for everything they've done over the years. And he points out that they're the only church to really support him during his mission trip. It was the Philippians that were supporting him even now while he's in prison. And it's interesting because we all have someone or a couple of someones in our lives who continually pour into us, who are constantly there for us. Sometimes when we're at our lowest, that person just shows up out of the blue to be there to, to help lift us up. And that's how Paul feels about this church. And one of the cool things was is that Paul told other churches about the church in Philippi. Paul told the church in Corinth and 2 Corinthians about the Philippian church. In 2 Corinthians 8, 1 through 5, he states, And now, brothers and sisters, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. And this is the church in Philippi. In the midst of a very severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability, entirely on their own. They urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the Lord's people, and they exceeded our expectations. They gave themselves first of all to the Lord and then by the will of God to us. I need you to pay attention that when Paul wrote about the church in Philippi. He says that in the midst of severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in their generosity. He goes on to say that they gave even beyond their ability. When was the last time we gave above our ability? If any of you are like me, we gave what was expected and we left it at that. If we even gave that much. So often we are wrapped up in our own issues, our own worries, our own struggles. We often forget there are people who are facing much more difficult situations. We talked last week about comparing ourselves to the Joneses, to the guy next door, to the guy up the street. We always compare ourselves to those who have more and wonder why we don't have it. But what if we are the Joneses? What about the people that are looking at us saying, if I only had It's interesting that we become so self-involved, so self-absorbed, that we fail to see the needs that God puts in our paths on a daily basis. And I'm not talking people who want a financial gain. How about the person that just needs you to listen? The person that just needs you to call and ask, how are you doing? How many times this week did one of us get up, pick up the phone and call someone and say, how are you? I was thinking of you. And I'd be the first to say, didn't happen once. And it was my challenge to myself. Through the writings of Paul, we've seen a different manner in which to live. He provides us with bright and shining examples of lives lived out filled with joy in which they were able to plead for the privilege of sharing in the service to the Lord's people. When was the last time you really pled with God to let you share in service to his people? 
And the funny thing is, it, it's not the group that's sitting here that you're thinking about and he's thinking about. We already know we take care of one another. Ryan, what's the use, word you use for neighbor? Everyone else? Thank you. That word, that everyone else. Those are the ones we're called to love. Yes, we need to love on each other, but I'm going to tell you right now, we do that in spades. It's everyone else. When it comes to giving, it's interesting that, that Ryan preached on this a couple years ago, and he told us that from Malachi we're told by God to test him in this to test him in our giving. Part of that does, in fact, talk about tithe, and I'm not here to talk about tithe. I see the books. We're doing really good, folks. We're doing way better than a lot of churches. A lot of churches in our own district are struggling way worse than we are. As a family, we take care of this church. My question when it comes to being able to test him in this, is how is it that we can plead with him to provide us with more opportunities to serve others in ways we don't even know yet? Because God has said, test him in this. He didn't just mean financially. He meant with your time, with your energy, with your emotions. So many people could care less about getting another buck or two from you. What they want is someone to talk to, someone to listen to, to hear them, to understand, to empathize. I am not the greatest at empathizing. I don't often see it from someone else's point of view, and I know that that's a struggle that I am desperately in need of help with. But I'm getting better. My goal this year was to try to be in relationship with my son more closely. To see things from his point of view even when I don't agree. Or especially when I don't agree. And to try. I think it's been pretty good with him. And I think it's gotten better this year. But the interesting statement that Paul uses when it was about the church in Philippi is that he said that they were pleading to provide even more opportunities to give. And Paul testifies that they were able to do that and more, above and beyond their ability. He goes on in verses 17 to 20. And he says, not that I desire your gifts. And he's talking about those physical financial gifts. What I desire is that more be credited to your account. In the beginning of Philippians, he used some accounting terms about I count it as loss or gain, credit or debit. And again, he comes back to an, a, a type of accounting thing saying, credited to your account. He's not talking a ledger that he kept. Paul didn't keep a ledger. But he knows that God does account for all those things you do. Paul states and goes on, I have received full payment and have more than enough. I am amply supplied now that I have received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent. They are a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice pleasing to God. And my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be the glory forever and ever. Amen. In these verses, Paul is not asking for more. In fact, all he wants is that their giving be reflected in their accounts with God. He wants the Father, the Father to bless them for the giving that they have done. Remember, nothing we do on earth goes with us. We can't take it. But everything we do for the least of them is recorded in heaven and will build our eternal reward. And these, 
This is the true reward that we should all be striving for. It shouldn't matter here. Where it matters is there. We're not living for the short time that we're here. We're living for the eternity that we will have with the Father. It will be in the hearing of those precious words. Well done, my good and faithful servant. If we can get out of our own heads and into our hearts, then we can truly begin to understand true joy and contentment. When we find the way to see and react to the needs and interests of others, our own needs and interests will be met. We can see that when Paul had received the gifts the church had sent, he talks about the fact that they were a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, and pleasing to God. For Paul, it was not the physical gift that was so important, but it was their spirit of love and devotion that Paul appreciated. It was this heart of the giver and the spirit in which the gift was given, which is the true offering and which was acceptable and pleasing to God. As we move into this, this next verse, it, it amazed me um, because in trying to find meaning, context of this verse, I googled it. And I YouTubed it. And it's amazing how many people will build an entire sermon on this next verse. Hopefully that's what's going to pop up here. And verse 19 states, And my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. I found literally hundreds of 10-minute, 20-minute, 40-minute, 50-minute sermons on this verse. And this was the only Bible verse they referenced. And it's an amazing verse. I love this verse. There's so much in here. There's even more if you take it out of context and put it wherever your little heart desires. And my God will meet all your needs according to the the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. For the guy that's decided he was going to surpass the Joneses and took six credit cards, racked them up to 100,000 bucks a piece, bought a $4 million house, and he's got his three ex-wives he's still supporting, And goes, ooh, I'm in some financial trouble. Well, it's okay. God will meet all my needs according to his riches in Christ Jesus. I'm not really sure that that's what God intended for us to take from this. But yet I find sermon after sermon that that's exactly what they're doing with this verse. They're taking this verse and saying, it doesn't matter how I've lived, it doesn't matter what I've done, God's going to take care of all my needs no matter what. But that's not what this verse is. This verse starts with a conjunction, an and, which meant there was something before it. There's not a therefore right now, but there's something that came before this that led Paul to write this. This verse has become a catchphrase, a Christianese response to struggles and pain. And don't get me wrong, is God able to provide for all of my needs? Absolutely. And he would love to do it. If. If I have followed through with all the things he's asked me. If I've given if I've put the needs and interests of others above my own, if. This this catchphrase is is, um, often taken out of context and it can put us into a big hole. 
but I think we're there already. We have to understand it and understand the context that this first came from. Paul has just spent an entire chapter leading up to this, all of, of, of 1 through 18, talking about a church who gave. In their deepest struggles, they gave. And they gave more than anyone thought they were able to give. And it came from a position of joy and contentment that their generosity was able to overflow. And at the end of this, it says, in Christ Jesus. There's that in the Lord phrase. It's interesting that God is more than capable of providing for us here on earth. He does it every day. He proves this by putting breath in our lungs, each and every breath, every single day. He does this when he makes sure that we have a roof over our head, clothes on our bodies, a place to lay down, food on the table, family and friends that surround us. He proves this by having the sun rise every day. He proves it by having the Holy Spirit stand by us and even carry us when we're at our weakest. He proved this by sending his one and only son to die a horrible death, a death on a cross, to take our sins as his own, the sinless one carrying all of our sins and taking to the grave and dying for us. The proof is further shown. The more, three days later when the stone was rolled away and the tomb was empty, Christ had risen from the grave. He had ascended to heaven to sit at the right hand of the Father. He defeated death and he has made a way for each and every one of us to regain a relationship, a right relationship with the Father. God has spent an eternity planning for ways to prove his love for us. But it is time for us to prove our love for him. It is time for us to take the lessons that Paul has taught us and is teaching us and really apply them in our lives. It's time for us to take the light of Jesus to a broken and dying world. It's time to be the salt and the light in a world desperately seeking a way to heal and become one. It is time to allow the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit full and total access to your heart, mind, body, and soul to instill in you the joy that you crave and you seek. Now Paul penned this letter to the church from a place often seen as being filled with hopelessness and loneliness, a prison. But for Paul, there was no hopelessness. There was no loneliness. In his writings and teachings, he didn't talk about all of that. He talked about the joy. He talked about what God meant in his life and what God was continuing to do in his life. And he knew that no matter what happened here, God had his back and would bring him home. In Paul's writing, there's an overflowing, abundantly loving message of joy, unending, God-given, and God-driven joy. In a life dedicated to serving Christ, Paul faced excruciating poverty, abundant wealth, and everything in between. He suffered beatings, imprisonment, and worse. And yet he was able to write this joyful letter from prison. Whatever the circumstances, Paul had learned to be content, finding real joy as he focused all of his attention and energy on knowing Christ and obeying him. Paul's desire to know Christ above all else is wonderfully expressed in the following words.
What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage, that I may gain Christ and be found in him. I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. In Paul's letter to the Philippians, he's laid out through four chapters that there is joy in suffering, there is joy in serving, there is joy in believing, and there is joy in giving. For us to access this joy and understand this joy, we have to spend time with God daily, sometimes minute to minute. Sometimes it's a matter of just taking the next five seconds and praying that he'll be there and then taking the next five seconds and asking him to stay there, asking him to stay with you as long as you need him. But to do this, we have to come to him with humility, like Christ. We must empty ourselves of our worldly selves and surrender to God's will for our lives. We must be willing to give up our self-interests and take on Christ's attitude to serve with joy, love, and kindness. We have to live self-sacrificially. Not sure if that's a word, but it sounded really good right there. We must live a life sacrificing ourselves to the needs and interests of others. For it is Christ who gives us the power to lay aside our personal needs and concerns, to utilize his powers to serve others. We must have unity. We must be of one body, striving against divisiveness, and find a way to come together and love everyone. It is in the Lord that we can find the strength to better understand the ideals of teamwork, consideration, and unselfishness. All right, I'm going to read the next ones for you because I don't want to happen to my slides. The fourth one is Christian living. Like Christ who gave us an example reflected in the life of Paul, we must strive to live Christ-like in our everyday struggles. It is in the Lord where we will find the strength to gain self-discipline, concentration, and obedience to God's word. And Tanisha, if you can find the joy one, I know it was there. In the fifth one, it's joy in the Lord. We can find profound joy, contentment, and serenity and peace. No matter what happens, our joy comes from knowing Christ personally and from depending on his strength rather than our own. We can have joy even in hardship. Joy does not depend on our outward circumstances, but from our inward strength, which draws directly on our trust of and our trust in Jesus Christ. Um, that's it, folks. <laughs>